Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me this morning. My name is AJ Piscor, Business Development Manager uh, for Combustion and Advanced Controls at Lessman Instrument Company. Uh, today's webinar will be focusing on, it'll be a continuation of a previous webinar that I did back in January on why won't my burner light off. And this one is titled, Why Does My Burner Keep Shutting Down? So for those of you that previously attended the Why My Burner Won't Light Off presentation, if you recall, I had gone through the steps in the light off sequencing. Um, and at each step in that light off sequence, there's a potential issue that would prevent the burner from advancing through the light off sequence and prevent the burner from lighting off. Um, today, we have uh, essentially worked all the way through the light off sequence and now we're in run mode. The burner is up and running. Uh, we've worked out all of those issues previously and now we're just focusing on the issue that happens all the time is that your burner is running, everything's looking good, you're producing, and then all of a sudden uh, the burner just randomly shuts off. So, uh, so we're gonna address uh, potential issues. Uh, so we're gonna diagnose the most common problem was it the burner that failed or did my flame sensor fail and, and what we can do to narrow down and figure out which one uh, happened for sure. Uh, we'll also briefly talk a little bit about the safety interlocks. We also covered it in the last conversation, right? Those safety interlocks, the running interlocks that we have have to be made at all times, not only during the light off sequence, but while we're running. Um, enunciators are great tools to, to help us narrow down and pinpoint the, the cause of that issue. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we also talk a little bit about outside influences, right? The, the flame safeguard is the really the, the core safety component in any um, burner management system. Um, but outside influences outside of the flame safeguard could cause some issues. So we'll talk a little bit about those and how to identify and address those issues. And then also just preventative maintenance. We'll talk a little bit about the um, things that you guys can be doing proactively uh, to make sure that your burner stays up and running. So we'll do a little bit of a review. Uh, we'll go through the common types of flame detection first, just very briefly. Uh, because they both will uh, have different types of issues and things that we would need to look for uh, to identify why your burner would shut down. So uh, the first one, very common type of flame detection is a flame rod, right? It uses the principle of flame ionization to pass the current through the flame to, uh, to verify uh, the presence of flame. Uh, so the flame safeguard sends out a high voltage signal uh, around 200 volts or so. Uh, through the flame rod that uh, when the flame is present, the flame, uh, the current goes through the flame to a burner ground. So when installing these, it requires proper grounding, right? You got to make sure that you've got that, that current path from the flame safeguard through to the ground. Um, so, you know, a lot of flame rod issues that we have just deals with the grounding. Um, and again, not Every application or every burner design uh, is compatible with the flame rod. Uh, I know customers like to use them a lot because they are fail safe and, and considerably less expensive than uh, some of the UV scanners, but uh, you'll have to talk to the burner manufacturer and look at their um, uh, product availability to see if uh, flame rods are suitable or not for that application. Uh, scanners, most likely UV scanners. Uh, again, we're just photo eyes looking at the different spectrums of light energy from the flame just to verify its presence. So we're looking at a straight line of sight to the to the base of the flame, trying to pick up uh, ultraviolet or uh, infrared uh, signatures. So when talking about flame rods, uh, you know, we want to ask ourselves, how can the flame rod fail, right? If we're trying to identify whether it's the sensor or the burner, let's, let's 
look at this sensor first and kind of go over the failure modes of the sensor. Uh, so the flame rod, uh, by design, it needs to be in the presence of that flame. And as you increase the firing rate of the burner, right, a good solid burner design is going to have a stable base uh, and a point of reference for that flame rod at all firing rates. Uh, so as you increase the firing rate, the flame grows in length, gets longer, but that base stays right there in the center of the burner, uh, right at the mixing point of the air and the fuel. Um, and, you, and you want it to stay there, right, because the flame rod needs to be able to continue to pick up that flame. If you've got uh, some kind of a burner, uh, whether it's by design or uh, maybe there's some other issue with the burner, if that flame front starts to lift off and move a little bit further downstream into the duct, obviously uh, that'll um, cause the flame rod to start losing that path through the flame to the ground. And you could uh, have some issues there uh, detecting the flame. Uh, again, grounding interference with any flame rod application. Uh, you need to have a good solid ground at all times. Uh, if there's some kind of other signal interference happening in the system that could be acting back on that ground, it could cause a disruption in that current. And uh, prevent the flame rod from detecting flame, even though flame may be uh, existing. A uh, drooping flame rod right there in the presence of the flame. Uh, typically, there are temperature limits on how how high of a chamber temperature that you can operate the flame rod in and, and what types of burners that you can use with a flame rod. Um, if they get too much temperature, uh, it could potentially sag or droop, and then at a certain critical point, uh, it would uh, ground against uh, the surface of the burner or the internals of the burner. Uh, and fortunately for the flame rod, even though we've got a path to ground, it's not the, the type of uh, current path that the flame safeguard likes to see. So it actually would fault out and um, rather than uh, giving you a false positive and remain running. So, uh, so that's a good thing. It's telling you, hey, something, something's not right here. And the idea is, you go in there and take a look, and you realize, oh, my flame rod uh, is not straight anymore. It's, it's, it's arcing down, and uh, then you would just replace it. Uh, another common issue that I've seen with flame rods is the fouling of the flame rod. If you've got too much soot, it might be. Uh, an application where you've got a continuous pilot uh, and there's a zone of rich combustion that's occurring around the flame rod. If that builds up with enough soot over time, your, your flame signal will, will gradually decrease. Uh, I've also had other applications, duct applications, where uh, there's been some corrosives or other uh, uh, particulate matter going through the ducts and collecting on the flame rod again, causing some, some fouling of that flame rod. Uh, so I have seen that as well. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, now talking about UV scanners and how the UV scanners can fail. Uh, obviously the UV scanner is a lot more, um, there's a lot more engineering complexity to it compared to the flame rod. Flame rod is a very simple, rod, whereas a UV scanner, you've got uh, electricity, you've got photo eyes, and with the self-checking UV scanners, you also have uh, potentially mechanical shutters in there. So you've got uh, extra components that make up the scanner, which means there's different failure modes of that scanner. Uh, all scanners uh, could be suspect to uh, getting a dirty scanner lens. Right, if you've got dirt or debris from the combustion chamber, could accumulate on that scanner lens and over time uh, mask uh, the uh, sensor, uh, the UV scanner from seeing the flame. Uh, again, with the self-checking scanners, the, the mechanical shutters that uh, every every six or 10 seconds will, uh, the mechanical shutter will drop in front of that photo eye. 
this is a uh, this is used primarily in continuous applications where you want to make sure that that photo eye doesn't oversaturate uh, and give you a false positive. If you're just making sure that the uh, when the shutter is in place uh, that the uh, that the photo eye temporarily does not see the flame. Uh, but with that, there's a little bit of a handshaking signaling between the flame safeguard and the UV scanner. The flame safeguard will initiate that shutter, say, hey, shutter, I want you to go closed. Uh, the shutter will go closed. Meanwhile, it'll still satisfy the flame safeguard with a, with a, with a flame signal so that you're not interrupting the process. But internally, the the photo eye momentarily stops seeing flame, and then when the shutter opens again, then it starts seeing flame again, and and that's the check that happens in the background. Uh, but if that <clears throat> if that shutter were to fail, for instance, it would fail to close. Now that photo eye is seeing flame, but the UV scanner and the flame safeguard are expecting. Uh, to not see the flame anymore. So it'll create a unique fault code. There'll be like a, a shutter fault code failure message depending upon the model flame safeguard that you have. Um, if the opposite happens, if the shutter goes down but it fails to open, uh, the photo eye will stop seeing flame. The, uh, the internal mechanism thinks that the shutter is open, but in fact it's closed. So what'll happen is it'll generate a, uh, a main flame failure, essentially the same type of failure message fault code that you would see if you had a had a loss of flame. Uh, so uh, it's important to know the difference of those two and to uh, to be able to to take out and inspect uh, that mechanism if you suspect the mechanical shutter failure. <clears throat> I've seen other applications where we've had excessive temperature or vibration on the scanner, right? We've got, you know, electrical components, we've got uh, the mechanical shutter, everything is susceptible to temperature and, and vibration. Uh, the manufacturer of the scanner should have some kind of tolerances, thresholds, maximum temperatures, ambient uh, that it can handle. Uh, obviously, if you're exceeding that, uh, that could be causing some some premature failures. Uh, similar to the flame rods, uh, signal interference or the background noise um, acting on the scanners could also cause some kind of a failure. Um, so disruption in the flame signal or shutter command uh, could cause uh, some kind of a failure message as well. And as I previously mentioned, that photo eye being burned in. So uh, so that photo eye. Uh, if you have a non-self-checking UV scanner, um, there is no mechanical shutter in there. If you oversaturate that photo eye, you could have a possibility of a, a false positive where uh, the flame goes out, but the UV scanner still detects uh, the presence of flame. It thinks it's seeing flame. Uh, that's why we use self-check scanners in the first place. Uh, we want to make sure that that does not happen. So uh, the typical rule of thumb is that if you've got an application where it's over 24 hours of continuous operation, um, <clears throat> the uh, NFPA code will want you to use a self-check UV scanner. If you had that scenario where you had the, the non-self-checking scanner without the uh, shutter mechanism and it were to fail, um, the idea being is that this is, uh, it's not a continuous application you would shut your burner down um, normally, and then uh, when you either go through the post purge or you go back through uh, uh, the initiate safe start check on the next light off command, it would say, "Hey, I'm I'm detecting a flame when there's not a flame present." That's really the best case scenario for uh, detecting the uh, burned in photo eye. So with Flame failures, we rely a lot on the uh, fault codes that are available from the flame safeguard. So here's an example. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Honeywell keyboard display. Uh, the one actually pictured here is a LCLB newer keyboard display, which has enriched text and, and troubleshooting 
uh, guide. So it's a really good value uh, for those of us that haven't memorized all the different uh, fault codes uh, for the uh, for the Honeywell Flame Safeguard the 7800 series. Uh, they are good to kind of help us get in the right direction, but sometimes they don't pinpoint the the source of the problem, right? So the Honeycode fault code eight, which is that flame amp shutter message that I previously mentioned. Uh, whenever I see that one, that's probably associated with the uh, with the scanner. Um, I, I don't see that one uh, fault code when you've got a scanner that's been working fine. Um, when I do see the main flame failure, uh, that's only telling me part of the story, right? It could be the burner or it could be the sensor, all right? In that scenario where I talked about the shutter um, stuck closed, that's an example where I, I would get the same fault code 17 main flame failure, but uh, in that example, it's the sensor that failed and not the burner that's failed. Uh, so we always recommend, and it's highly recommended that we always have some kind of a spare sensor available to swap out, right? It's common troubleshooting practice that I'm sure you guys have all done is that you, you take a look at your system, try to identify where the issue could be coming from and change one variable uh, at a time. So if you go through and you change out uh, the, the sensor, whether it be a flame rod or UV sensor, and the problem goes away, it's uh, pretty safe to say that the original sensor uh, was, the, was the culprit. Uh, but if you swap out the sensor and you keep on having the same problem, uh, then we got to look elsewhere. So I wanted to put together uh, some tips uh, for improve, improving, not only improving the flame signal strength, but really just the reliability of your sensor. Uh, and for flame rod applications, uh, for the particularly for the Honeywell 7800 series, I've had a lot of better success using the extended distance flame amplifiers. Uh, so a lot of the uh, flame rod flame amplifiers have a alternate part number where it would have the same flame failure response time, um, but would be, uh, there's a little asterisk on there. It says it's quote, good for distances greater than 50 feet. Uh, I've used them in all of my applications, even if it's not greater than 50 feet. It seems to bump up the voltage signal uh, a good, volt and a half, maybe two volts. So if I was getting maybe two, two and a half volts on the standard flame amplifier, I switched out for the extended distance and I would be you know, between four and five. Um, the other thing that you can do is just periodic inspection of the flame rods and keeping them clean, right? If you've got flame rods that could be fouling and building up some soot, maybe good just to uh, inspect those periodically. I say every three to six months. Everybody's application is different, right? If you are, if you have an application where it's a little bit uh, of a dirtier application and your flame rod is more suspect to fouling, um, you may want to uh, inspect them a little bit more frequently. Then, as they uh, as they age, um, you'll you'll see uh, if if the fouling is not coming off or you start to see a decrease in your flame signal, uh, you just may want to just replace them as needed. Uh, usually, um, you know, every three to six months, keep them clean and then maybe annually, just once a year, replace them would be a good rule of thumb. Uh, for UV scanner applications, uh, if, you, if you're not already bringing purge air into the site pipe, it's, uh, it's a common practice and a highly recommended one. Um, Again, it keeps the scanner lens uh, clean, free of debris, right? So uh, if you've got dirt or debris in the application, depending upon where that uh, site pipe is, it could be coming back and collecting on the uh, scanner lens. Uh, bringing a little bit of purge air uh, into the system will just help keep that, uh, keep that area uh, free and clear so the dirt has to go elsewhere downstream in the combustion chamber. Uh, it's also good for higher temperature applications where you could be getting uh, heat transfer. Uh, you might be getting some uh, 
uh, some heat from the chamber trying to act back on the scanner. Uh, again, keeping positive pressure in that sight pipe will uh, will keep that scanner lens uh, uh, cool and prevent the heat transfer from acting back on the uh, UV scanner and the electronics in the scanner itself. Uh, one other thing that you can do just to prevent uh, excessive conductive heat transfer as well as isolating of electrical noise is they have heat insulating nipples that are available uh, for certain scanner products. So it's a uh, it's a it's a high strength um, resin um, product. Uh, Honeywell and Fire I each have have their own. Uh, 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 most of the industrial applications uh, using uh, the you know, like the Fire Eye Insights or the Honeywell IFM products, we typically put uh, at least one heat insulating nipple or have a heat insulating material uh, in there to protect uh, to uh, isolate any kind of uh, signals that may be present from the combustion chamber or on the burner ground from acting back on the scanner, as well as just you know, preventing the conductive heat transfer from acting back on that scanner as well. Um, also, uh, consider upgrading your UV scanner. I, I see a lot of our customers still using, uh, you know, at least in Honeywell's uh, world, the C7012 scanners, and I've seen even some older ones like C7076s. Uh, those scanners uh, tend to not produce the uh, a great flame signal, um, and uh, I've had a lot of success with the C7061 models. Uh, they are, uh, you can still use the same flame safeguard. You may have to replace the flame amplifier. Uh, so the C7061 uses an R7861 flame amplifier. And uh, again, they're available in the same uh, flame failure response times as the C7012 flame amplifiers. Um, but actually the cost, if you look at it, Honeywell, um, it, our, the cost for a C7061 scanner plus the flame amplifier is typically less than the cost of just a C7012 uh, scanner. Uh, so you may want to consider that just not only will it increase uh, the flame signal strength, but it's, uh, I can't say for how long Honeywell will be uh, keeping the C7012 scanners uh, available. Um, we've seen last year Honeywell uh, had gone through and obsoleted a number of their uh, legacy 7800 series uh, products. Uh, so anytime I see some of the older scanners, I, I challenge our customers to consider going with a newer scanner model. And then also um, for really stubborn applications where uh, you've got some transition issues from pilot to main or that main flame uh, doesn't quite stay stable in the, uh, in the burner and it starts to lift away. Uh, sometimes adding a second UV scanner in parallel uh, would be a way to increase your uptime, right? So now instead of uh, having just one single scanner picking up your pilot in your main flame, you could have a second scanner uh, in an alternate location, whether it be through the back of the burner or looking from the combustion chamber back in, uh, that uh, if you wire it in parallel, it's kind of a, an or type uh, application where I need to see flame signal in the primary or the secondary to keep the flame safeguard satisfied. Um, you definitely want to review your, your your code guidelines. So depending upon the application, they may or may not allow for this arrangement, uh, specifically with uh, line burners where you need to prove flame propagation. But uh, uh, for a lot of applications, uh, it's uh, it's a pretty easy uh, uh, change to make. With the Honeywell products, you're just adding that second scanner, and you're just doubling up on the on the terminals. You do lose when you've got the flame signal strength. It's kind of a composite flame signal strength. You don't have flame signal strength on the primary versus sec secondary scanner. Um, so you, if you're starting to lose flame signal in one or the other, you may not be able to detect that. But uh, you know. Holistically, if you look at the system as a whole, uh, it's going to be a lot more reliable.
So you went through, we checked out the sensor, everything's working fine, but you're still having the issues. So, uh, so now what, what do we need to be looking at? So if your flame sensor checks out, you know, the flame safeguard is turning off the burner for a couple of different reasons. So uh, number or letter A, it was told to shut off. So most all flame safeguards have a call for heat signal where essentially it says, hey, hey, I want to initiate the light off sequence and run the burner. Uh, B, you could have your running interlock and those could also open up. And depending upon the model of flame safeguard, that'll uh, display some kind of a lockout with a fault code. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, but uh, yeah, uh, those running interlocks always need to be made. If you lose them at any time, it'll shut you down. And then C, you've got a genuine loss of flame, right? Where for whatever reason, uh, the burner's running and all of a sudden the flame goes out. Uh, of course, you'll get a lockout uh, with a fault code when that happens. And I'll kind of go over each of these scenarios here real quick. So you lost the call for heat, right? So the call for heat's that input signal that goes into the flame safeguard that says, okay, I want to start the light off sequence and I want to continue to run. When you pull away that call for heat, when it's time to shut the system down, then it will go through its normal uh, post purge. It will not cause a, an alarm or a lockout condition. It's the safe way of shutting your burner down. Uh, but it's a very sensitive terminal that uh, if you lose it for just a you know fraction of a second, it'll it'll start that that uh, shutdown cycle. So um, you want to be certain that you've got uh, that call for heat on at all times. I've seen some applications where that call for heat originates locally at the control panel via a push button or some kind of a selector switch. Whereas other applications, it's coming from a remote panel where you've got some type of relay contact that uh, would energize closed. Um, and sometimes you've got a combination of uh, multiple you know, right, uh, devices feeding into that call for heat. So you wanna just make certain that, that any of those connections didn't momentarily open up for whatever reason, right? So all of your, holding solenoid or holding relays are, are staying energized. Um, but I, I have seen it before where, uh, where just a little bit of a loose wire and some vibration in the panel caused that uh, call for heat just to momentarily um, open up. And then it was frustrating for the customer because they weren't getting an alarm, right? The burner was shutting down safely and then when the call for heat terminal of that wire connected again, it would just start the light off sequence back up again. So you definitely want to check for wiring for loose connections or anything like that. And um, another point is that some flame safeguards, they have that call for heat is going through the same terminal as the interlock string. So You've got your, you know, your low gas, high gas, combustion air pressure interlocks, all the ones that you normally see feeding into the flame safeguard. And then once all of your interlocks are satisfied, then it goes through the light off sequence and allows the burner to operate. Um, so you should be aware of which type of flame safeguard that you have and how that call for heat is, is being introduced uh, into the system. And know that if you have a system that turns the burner off but doesn't cause an alarm it's most likely coming uh, because of this uh, loss of the call for heat signal uh, the next one is the running interlocks right you've got like i previously mentioned your low gas high gas pressure switches uh, combustion air fan excess temperature limit interlock all need to be satisfied and running at all times uh, to keep the burner up and running. If you lose any of those at any time, uh, your burner will slam shut and it should, if you've got the type of flame safeguard that has the interlock string separate from the call for heat string, it should display some kind of a fault code. 
And if you have an enunciator that picks up that fault, uh, it should give you a first out message, right? So our enunciators uh, really come in handy uh, complicated systems where you, you maybe have six, eight, ten different interlocks, and the majority of them are automatic reset. Where, uh, let's say, if you got your low gas pressure switch trips off for whatever reason, then your valve slams shut. When your valve slams shut, the gas pressure increases, makes the low gas pressure switch. Uh, where it, since it's automatic reset, it now says that it's fine. Uh, but obviously your system shut down. If you're not there to see it happen in real time, you may not know what caused that shutdown, but these uh, enunciators will really help uh, for um, pinpointing the source of the lockout when you've got uh, the first out capabilities uh, with that enunciator. I have seen it where the, where the fault acts so quick that it's not picked up by the enunciator. And um, when that happens, uh, you are sometimes chasing your own tail, but what you can do is you can kind of go through uh, each of your interlocks, putting a momentary jumper on it to see if it's happening at the same point in time and, uh, and kind of isolating it that way. Uh, but we always recommend the use of manual reset devices when appropriate. Uh, so we see this all the time, and when you got your fuel train and you got your low gas, high gas pressure switches, they're, they're available in manual or automatic reset, and it really is just a customer preference, which one uh, do you like to have? And sometimes it's not, like if the fuel train is in an odd location where it's difficult for an operator to, to easily get at, to reset it, they'll, they'll go with automatic, but we typically recommend manual resets you know, for this scenario, uh, when you do have a uh, increase or decrease in gas pressure and the valve slams shut, uh, an automatic reset device will reset itself. The high gas pressure switch, the line will, uh, the pressure will drop in the line as soon as the valve slams shut. So then it'll go back below the threshold and reset itself. And then this previous scenario, if you have your low gas pressure switch, it falls below when the valve slams shut since then pressure switches upstream of the shutoff valves, you'll see a pressure spike, that spike will uh, go back above the threshold for that low gas pressure switch and you'll be satisfied there. So uh, we typically like to recommend using manual reset devices there because once you hit the button, you'll realize, okay, that was, that was the source of the issue and then you can go through and, and address it. Uh, your excess temperature limit interlock is, is manual reset by code. Uh, you'll need to wait for the temperature to drop back down before you hit that one. So that one's a pretty easy one to pick up. Uh, now we've got the genuine loss of flame, right? I am, I had a flame in my chamber and the flame went away. And uh, so what I wanted to do was kind of go through a little bit of a combustion triangle review, right? We've got our combustion triangle here on the screen where you've got your Oxygen, which is usually in the form of combustion air, your fuel, which is usually a hydrocarbon fuel like natural gas, and then you got your heat source. So during the light off sequence, it's the uh, it's a spark igniter. During the uh, during run, during your main flame, it's just the continued heat from the chemical reaction. So in order for combustion to occur, you need not only all three of these elements, but you need the proper ratio of oxygen to fuel as well. So a majority of our industrial customers are using hydrocarbon fuels uh, for their industrial burners. And I just put on here uh, that obviously each fuel has a upper and lower flammability limit. Any operation outside of that flammability limit will, um, combustion cannot occur. So it can only occur between those two limits. And, um, and obviously like when you've got a burner where you're modulating, you need to stay within those limits at all times, you know, between low fire and high fire. Uh, this table just shows uh, the common hydrocarbon fuels and their properties, right? So natural gas, which is the most common one, 5% lower flammability and 15% upper flammability. And then stoichiometric is just the, uh, the uh, 
ratio of air to fuel where there's uh, where the chemical uh, reaction is complete and there's no excess fuel or excess uh, oxygen in that equation, right? So it's the it's the ideal amount of uh, air to gas. So for natural gas, it's it's roughly 10 to one. I think some people may say like 9.7, 9.6 to one. Um, and then the relative percentage of gas uh, in that mixture is also listed on this table. When talking about industrial burners though, you, you don't see in the catalogs uh, the uh, stoichiometric ratio uh, or the um, ratio of air to gas. You see it normally expressed as a percent of excess air, right? So stoichiometric combustion, if you've got the exact amount of air needed to complete you know, whatever volume of gas, that would be considered 0% excess air. So stoichiometric combustion is 0% excess air. Uh, most industrial burners, though, require a certain percentage of excess air um, for a number of reasons, right? We want good, stable flame. We want a, we want a nice, secure flame base at all firing rates. And um, the way that we can achieve this is by adding, if we add a little bit of excess air, additional airflow required beyond combustion to the burner, we can shape that flame and make sure that it stays in place, as well as keep the uh, burner internals cool. Uh, and we also, we don't want the flame length to get too out of control as well. So, um, so we introduce excess air uh, just as a way of shaping that flame and containing that flame within our um, predetermined uh, uh, flame envelope, if you will. Now with each burner, because they're introducing air into the burner, they're, they're not introducing it all at once. If you look at a burner design, there's usually a mixing cone or an air orifice plate, which kind of stages the airflow where maybe it's giving a little bit of air in the center and then it's gradually spreading more air out around the outside so that as the flame length gets a little bit longer and introduces it kind of just gradually introduces the combustion air into the flame uh, again just to create that flame shape and stability uh, so uh, most burners run uh, with uh, you know 10 percent excess air and, and, and above uh, they all vary some low NOx, uh, low emissions burners run a little bit more excess air uh, to help control the, uh, the, the NOx production. Uh, other burners will run a little bit on the richer side to help control uh, the CO production. So it all just depends upon uh, the type of burner uh, that you have. So you may wanna look at the, uh, uh, the burner manufacturer and their, uh, and their recommendations for air fuel ratio. Uh, but just generically speaking, uh, each burner, there's going to be, again, a similar kind of window uh, between the upper and lower limits of flammability where the, the burner needs to be operate, the, needs to operate to stay happy, right? So if you deviate outside of these lines, uh, you could be causing some, some flame stability issues. So uh, just an example here, if we had some kind of a change in the, in the system that caused a 10% increase in excess air across the entire range of the burner. You can see that the black line that normally is going between there starts to veer up and at a point around 65% firing rate, uh, you get into that too lean area above the blue line and, and that could cause you to obviously fail out uh, or flame out rather. And then uh, the opposite is also true. If you had a decrease of 10% excess air, uh, you start reducing that excess air. As you increase firing rate, as you get to a higher firing rate, uh, you're starting to, start to introduce too much fuel into the system and you could get to the point where you're not too rich to, to sustain combustion for that particular burner. So in this example, it looks like I 
uh, the burner would go out at around 55% firing rate. So uh, why, why would the air fuel ratio change, right? If, if you went through and you set up your burner, either yourself or you had a technician come in and, and tune the burner, uh, why would it change? So obviously seasonal changes. I would assume that most of you guys are here in the Midwest. Some of you guys may be attending from other parts of the country, but uh, here in the Midwest, obviously it gets very cold in the winter, warm in the summer. If you're pulling your combustion air from outside, it could cause a pretty significant change in the mass flow of, uh, of oxygen into your, uh, into your burner. So that could alter your air fuel ratio curve. And depending upon the severity of that change and how you have your burner set up, you could get to that point where you may be leaning your burner out during the winter. Um, Another common one is combustion chamber fluctuations. If you've got some kind of an application where you're firing into a combustion chamber, but that combustion chamber pressure fluctuates as other external dampers go open and closed, and you see drastic changes in the chamber pressure, if your system's not designed to account for those chamber fluctuations, uh, you could see a pretty drastic change in your in your air fuel ratio. Uh, most all industrial burner applications are uh, they've got a fixed air orifice and a fixed fuel orifice, and uh, because it's a fixed orifice, you typically uh, the very quick and easy way to verify flow is just measuring your differential pressure from the uh, from the test connection ports on the back of the burner to the chamber. Uh, so there's all the burner manufacturers have catalog information where if they make the chamber test ports available, you'll see that for my combustion airflow, maybe I need 20 inches of water column at, at high fire and I only need 10 inches of water column of gas pressure at high fire. So you've got about a two to one ratio between your pressures of air and pressure of gas. If you have a chamber fluctuation, that's significant enough. Um, let's say five inches of uh, chamber pressure fluctuation. Um, that will cut your um, air pressure down from 20 inches to 15 inches, but now your gas is cut down from 10 inches to five inches. So you're going to be running a lot leaner than you were previously to that chamber fluctuation. So something to keep in mind. And typically with high with applications where you do have chamber fluctuations, you have some kind of method, whether it's uh, backloading a regulator or using some kind of a mass flow control system uh, to, uh, to account for and adjust uh, the air fuel ratio based on the chamber fluctuations. But something to keep in mind uh, if you're having problems maintaining your ratio. Uh, mechanical linkage, a lot of uh, customers are still using the uh, mechanical linkage, whether it's internal to the burner or external to the burner. Uh, the external linkage, uh, depending upon its complexity and how many valves it's trying to control, there could be some slop or hysteresis. And over time, uh, screws could get turned out and, and linkage arm positions could slip or change. All of this would affect the, the air fuel ratio. Um, I've also seen where you've got inconsistent inlet pressure to the fuel train as well, right? So if that, if that inlet pressure drops off enough, you know, the regulator is supposed to try to maintain a constant outlet pressure, but can only do so within a certain limit. So if that drops too far off, uh, you could start decreasing your uh, airflow or your fuel flow to the burner. Uh, and then that'll cause your burner to go out of ratio. If you, obviously, if it drops down too far, you'll trip your low gas pressure switch. Uh, but if it's, if it's, just low enough, it could start just tweaking your air fuel ratio, and you might see that that uh, that issue first before you trip off your low gas pressure switch. So, how can you how can you maintain the proper air fuel ratio? Um, so, one of the things is that if you've got an application where you're not automatically correcting or adjusting for chamber pressure fluctuations or seasonal changes, um, you'll just want to just go through and verify your air fuel ratios at some kind of a periodic uh, uh, interval. 
uh, and it also it all depends upon the type of burner, the type of controls, and and the uh, and the way that your system operates. You know, I had a customer that they had all the test setups on each of the burners, and they did it weekly because it was that important for them. Uh, that the extreme case, I would think that you probably want to do it maybe, uh, you know, maybe two or three times a year, uh, just making sure that your mechanical linkage is still in check, nothing changed with your gas pressures or your chamber pressures at all, um, and and then you can, you know, based on uh, the way that the burner sets up, uh, you know, you would go through and record, these are the ideal pressures flows that I want to see and then you can go through and make your micro adjustments as you as you do that periodic check that's a very easy thing to do uh, for certain uh, applications uh, customers uh, like to put a combustion analyzer on the on the exhaust stream right so uh, combustion analyzer like the one pictured uh, shows o2 co and then uh, no or, or nox and Based on those levels, uh, you can determine whether your burner's air fuel ratio is uh, is optimal or if it needs to be adjusted. Uh, if it's a frequent problem, you may want to consider upgrading from a mechanical linkage to electronic linkage or parallel positioning, right? In that scenario where we talk about mechanical linkage and hysteresis, if that continues to be a problem, um, upgrading to some kind of electronic linkage where instead of having the mechanical pieces tying the valves together, you've got separate actuators electronically linked. Not only will it give you, uh, not only will it eliminate the mechanical hysteresis, but a lot of these products also have the ability to save separate summer curves and winter curves and allow you full adjustment over each of the valves where sometimes like on a micro ratio valve from max on the air valve you can only adjust the air valve at two positions whereas if you have a parallel positioning system you can adjust the air valve at multiple positions between low fire and high fire um, the other thing is that you just gotta um, install or maintain your sight glasses and learn what what a good flame looks like if you're responsible for an oven furnace dryer whatever the application may be um, just having a good you know visual view of the flame where you can see the color of the flame the length of the flame tells a lot about just the health of the flame and, and uh, if you're trained in combustion you know what to look for in each burner typically what you like to see is at a higher firing rate you still have a stable blue base to a flame and then sometimes you'll have orange fingers uh, it all depends upon the type of burner but uh, you know if if you don't have uh, a sight glass i highly recommend trying to figure out a way to put one in let you can contact lesman we've got sight glass products um, that you guys can can consider installing but uh, again just you know seeing the flame is just a a, a great way of quickly knowing that you know, you know, not only you know we're trying to troubleshoot the flame, so you can if you can see the flame and you can see the flame get paler and paler and paler and then go off, then that lets you know that hey, I I, I do have an air fuel ratio issue that I have to address. Uh, if you're um, if you don't have a visual of that flame, it'd be hard to hard to detect that. So I had previously, a number of years ago, did a little bit more of an in-depth conversation, two-parter of air fuel ratio control. Uh, so if you guys are more interested in learning about air fuel ratio control and industrial applications, I invite you to go to our website. I put the links here on the screen. Uh, it's the same website where you would have gone to to register for this webinar. Uh, if you go back you can look, I think we've got uh, a table set up where we've got all the combustion ones in one area and you can look back through and you can see the, the two uh, air fuel ratio uh, webinars that I had previously done. And I also just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we are doing another webinar uh, next week, Wednesday, uh, same time at nine o'clock and the title is simple 
solutions for remote process monitoring. Uh, so uh, Lessman has a number of different products, tools that you can use to monitor your process remotely by PC, tablet, or, or cell phone. Uh, so we just wanted to do a webinar, you know, a lot of just with the current situation that's going on right now with the COVID-19 that a lot of you guys are, are either working from home or you've got limited uh, staff at the uh, that are that are manning the process. Uh, so we're starting to see an increased interest in uh, remote process monitoring where uh, you can uh, use the technology that you already have in your cell phone to, to keep track of your uh, system. Uh, so again, it'll be next week, Wednesday at nine o'clock. Myself and Dan Wisey will be doing that webinar. And if you are interested, you can go to lessman.com slash training.html and you can follow the link to go through and register. Well, I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, I hope everybody uh, got a little something out of this webinar and I wanted to open it up uh, for any kind of questions that, that you guys may have. Um, if you guys are on the GoToMeeting app, you can see that there's a, uh, a toolbar and there's a little questions tab uh, that you can go through and, and enter your questions into. Uh, so I'll give you guys just a, a couple of minutes uh, if you want to uh, ask your questions now. I'll answer them live. Um, I have also put my uh, email address, uh, hap at lessman.com, on the screen as well. If you are uh, if you don't want to ask the entire group or if you're watching uh, the recording of this webinar, uh, feel free to, to email me and, and I'll get back to you and uh, let you know uh, and help you out with your particular question. Okay, I see a question. How do you solve the lack of C7012 and C7061 Honeywell flame detectors? And that is from Castells. Can you clarify, are you talking about just the lack of availability right now of those products? Yes, there is no supply. So, okay, Roger, yeah, so there, is currently a uh, shortage of self-checking scanners that are um, that are out right now. Uh, Honeywell is working on it. I've been told that they should have that resolved um, in a couple of weeks. Um, as far as an alternative, it gets a little tricky, Roger, because uh, the if you've got a 7800 series flame safeguard uh, that you're using with it. Uh, you can only use the Honeywell scanner products with it. So um, is your, Roger, do you want to let me know, is your application continuous 24 hours or do you, do you shut down once a day? It's continuous. So yeah, uh, unfortunately there's, there's not like, I can't use a FireEye scanner in place of uh, the, the Honeywell scanner. Uh, the only other thing that I could offer is that uh, if the scanner that you have has failed, Honeywell does have uh, replacement components. It's possible uh, that, that the replacement components like the sh shutter mechanism or the photo eye might be available sooner than the, than the uh, replacement scanner itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, unfortunately with the... Uh, the Honeywell, if you if you have a continuous application, I mean, you could, in theory, put in a uh, non-self-checking UV scanner, which those are readily available. You'd have to replace the amplifier card as well. Uh, but if you keep that installed, uh, there's a, uh, you know the code says that if you got a continuous application. Uh, they should have a UV scanner, but there is a, let me grab my code book here. There's some language in there that says you can use it if you periodically 
check to make sure that the uh, sensor has not been burned in. Let me just get the exact language. Uh, Roger, while I look this up, what kind of, are you, is this a boiler or is this a furnace? Is this a dryer? A burner? Oh, um, is it on a boiler or is this on a, is it NFP86 or NFP87? Or sorry, NFP85 or NFP86 type application? Okay, and a boiler. Okay, so that's NFP85. Let me grab my NFP85 book here real quick. Uh, while I look this up, is there anybody else attending that also has another question? Frank asked, what code book are you referencing? Frank, I am referencing NFPA 85 Boiler in Combustion Systems Hazardous Code. I have the 2015 edition. And then NFPA 86 Standard for Ovens and Furnaces, I have the 2019 edition. And really, these two code books are the the main ones that, that we reference when talking about the different safeties that are required. Oh, uh, Roger asked, can we download this presentation? So. We will uh, make a link available on our website at lessman.com slash train uh, that will have not only a re recording of this presentation, but also uh, my PowerPoint presentation will be available for download there. Yes, uh, we will give it to you. And I know that we're, we're approaching the, the hour time frame. So, um, Roger, what I'll do is I will I will look this up and, and reach out to you directly. I've got your contact information, um, but I'll I'll get that answer about the uh, what you can do about that other scanner application here shortly. Okay, all right, thank you, Roger. And then there's another question. I am running a, a burner for an oxidizer. Can you explain a bit more about the? Oh, hold on a second, let me. Oh, explain more about the enunciator. I have a low flow switch for our oil system and a high temp oil interlocks. Okay, so this was asked by Jason. So yeah, so Jason, the uh, enunciator uh, is a device that uh, essentially will uh, monitor your uh, hardwired interlock string and it'll check for uh, the presence of voltage between each of the interlocks because your interlocks are usually wired in series to the flame safeguard. And what will happen is that if it sees you lose power uh, on one terminal within that interlock string, it'll record which terminal that it was lost from and then that terminal is associated with the interlock just upstream of that uh, of that terminal, right? So if you've got a uh, if you got your um, high temp oil or your low flow switch, rather, if you got one of those two in your interlock string, and it uh, and it opens up, the enunciator is checking for presence of uh, voltage just upstream of that interlock, and so if it sees power lost there, but power maintained on the on the ones upstream of it, it narrows it down and says, oh yeah, I, uh, I don't have, uh, yeah, I lost the, uh, uh, I lost the oil flow, uh, I lost the low flow switch rather. And so that, that'll kind of pinpoint it and narrow it down. Okay, so let me just go through here. Okay, so Roger, I will get back to you. Uh, off 
decline. All right. Okay, uh, there's another question that was asked. Uh, what, what are the steps of tuning dual fuel burner? Okay, so if you've got a dual fuel burner, um, uh, uh, does he, is that dual fuel? Are you running both fuels uh, to, together or are you doing either or for the um, dual fuel are you selecting? And, and can you let me know what the fuel types are? Is it oil and gas or something else? Okay, I think uh, maybe I'll, I'll I'll reach out to you offline, uh, Desi, and I can let you know a little bit about that. Uh, okay, Tony Marquez, what is a good retrofit for going linkageless ratio control? Is it true that the Honeywell control link is not going to be supported any longer? Does Lesman rep other manufacturers for boiler application? Okay, so Tony, yes, Honeywell uh, has obsoleted the control links product, uh, so that's uh, it's no longer uh, available. Uh, Honeywell does uh, their their offering or their their option for um, linkageless ratio control is to use their their new slate system, which has uh, a fuel air ratio control module and similar low torque actuators to what the control links have. Uh, it would involve you also using the slate's burner control module for the flame supervision and, and the light off sequencing as well. Um, and uh, if you want to reach out to me, I can give you some more information on that. FireEye does also make a uh, parallel positioning system called Nexus. And um, that one uh, would also require the use of their flame safeguard uh, as well as their uh, air fuel ratio control. So there are some other alternatives that are out there. Okay, so I owe Roger a uh, an email, and then um, I think Jason. I think we were all set there. Uh, uh, does he Yang? I will also just reach back out to you and follow up with you offline. Um, I think that looks like that's it for all the questions. So again, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, this morning, I want to um, uh, also just remind you that if you've got time available next week uh, and you want to attend our uh, our other uh, webinar that we're doing on the first for remote process monitoring, uh, you can go to our website and register for that. And just want to um, just uh, again thank you guys all and and stay safe.